Uh, let's head to uh, the Detroit area, and we have um, Matt Harbor doing our demonstration tonight. Matt can be with us as soon as he talks. There he is, and we got him <laughs> spotlighted. All right, am I good to go? Yeah, you're, you're good to go. All right, uh, I, I'm Matt Harbor. Uh, the, my demo tonight is on finials. Um, so let me uh, switch to this one here. So uh, there's my contact information. Uh, this is a sea urchin ornament that I turned with a finial on both the top and the bottom. Um, oh, that didn't work. Sorry. Hang on a second, guys. Something going on with the computer here. Um, so these are finial examples. These are all uh, working finials. They all work. You can, it can be elaborate or small or an icicle like on the ornaments, uh, the urchin ornaments in the middle bottom there. You can do, you can make them like that one in the lower left corner where it's done as a uh, inside out ornament. Um, so these all work. These are all working examples. Uh, one of the things that you want to like the, the, the one uh, second from the right is a small little finial that's black on top of a red vase or something hollow form. And uh, I, I think it's important to make your finial fit your piece. So if you've got a small little box, you don't want to put a big honking finial on it. And likewise, if you've got a really big vase, probably a little tiny finial isn't going to cut it. So uh, try to keep that in mind. Um, these are more examples here. Um, let me switch to this camera here and say that, and do a little talk, uh, chalk talk, first of all. Um, I'm a fan of Cindy Drozda's work. Let me, let me do it this way. Um, and she uh, tries to build the finials as a, as a tall pyramid or a cone. So these outer lines show how she thinks about things. And I, I like this look. So basically, the first thing I do when I turn a finial is, is I'll turn it into a long cone, and then I'll begin shaping the bits and pieces of it. Um, you're always working towards your headstock down here so that you keep the thin bits out here, and you don't come back to them. So if you need to sand them, you sand them when they're done, and then you move further down and do the next parts. Okay? So these are, uh, uh, let me switch back to this. These are more examples. The ones all on the lower side there are all uh, icicle finials. Um, the finials on the top row, uh, one, two, three, and five are all based on the Cindy Drozda way of looking at them. Um, I don't know who did number five, but someday I'll do something like that too. <laughs> But these are not mine. These are ones I got off the internet somewhere, ones that I admire and look to inspiration for. Uh, okay, any questions so far on any of that so far? That's a no. Nope, let's rock and roll. All right. Um, let me switch back to this and go here. Um, so my steps on this are, are, are pretty basic, and I've tried to be very explicit. So... Uh, between centers, I'm going to turn uh, the tenon and the base, and 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 then I put it in my chuck. So that's I'm going to start from this point. Uh, so, and then and then I'll, and then I'll uh, from doing doing step two. Okay, so that's where I'll start at the end of step two. Begin turning the the finial from the tailstock and moving towards the headstock. I just talked about that so that you keep the meat of the wood so that things don't wobble and you don't have, you're not trying to turn with things that are too thin between you and the headstock. Uh, when chattering or bowing is detected, uh, you need to finish the tailstock end and remove the tailstock. And if you can support the, uh, the finial at that point, that's a good idea. Now, uh, in, in meetings past, we've talked about uh, string steadies and a, a, a string steady rest is a small tool rest that, that uses a piece of wax string to hold the, the finial. Um, tonight, when I get to that point, I'm going to use uh, uh, a little bit of, of kit here that Don Doyle makes. This is from Rubber Chucky. It's got a bearing in the end and it just, it fits on your, it screws onto your tailstock uh, on the, under the mandrel. And that I will use that to hold it steady. 
when we get there, but uh, I could probably get it done without doing that. Um, but I like to be sure. So, uh, and I'll show that when I get there. Um, okay. So, and this is important, step number five, and any pressure applied by tools or sanding must be matched by equal pressure to minimize bowing and our chatter. So what that means, and I'll show that when I get there, and I'll start turning here in a second um, so that we can, when we get there, I can show that. Um, so what that means is that if I'm turning a very thin finial and I'm sanding on this side, I need to put a support or a finger on the other side so that I don't break the finial off. Is that clear? Oh yeah, I learned, I read that someplace. Didn't happen to me. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure. Okay, um, some of the finials that I've done here uh, are, this This was one of the first little ones I did. This is, out, the, these first three are out of box elder and I broke the tip off of this, but I, it was nice enough that I decided I'd try and finish it a little bit. So I'll find a use for that at some point. Uh, this is another practice I did. Uh, I did this one in one of the demos I did. So now you'll notice something that these all have the same size little tenon on the bottom of them. And that's what this is for. This is a little wrench I got at my corner pawn shop for like a buck. And it's my, it's my, my gauge. So my tenons are all exactly a quarter of an inch. And what that means is I can, wherever I want to put this finial, I can just drill, a, you know, put a quarter inch drill bit or a quarter inch Forstner bit in my drill and just make the hole and all the finials will fit. So if I'm in finial making mode, I'll just make a bunch of them with a quarter inch tenon on them and then they'll fit anything I make with a quarter inch hole. So this one I did in another demo. This is hard maple, no longer box elder. Hard maple is what I'm going to be using tonight. Um, I used my, my, little, uh, my little wood burning deal to, to burn that line in there just to show how it could be done. And finials can take a lot of different forms. Like this is a single piece of wood. I think I did this in a demo for you guys at one point. I don't remember, but this little finial on the bottom of this, of this little ornament here is, is, is a legit finial and it's not too big and it's not too small. And I had this one sitting around here on the, uh, that I've been playing with for quite a while. And I made this birdhouse and decided to, because it's been sitting in my shop, I like, all right, I'm gonna stick that on there. So I did, and it's probably a little long, but it works. Um, and I've got some bloom on the, the lacquer. So I've got to do some sanding and finish it up a little bit. But um, this was, I, I do some playing. I, I, this is a good, I don't know, six inches long. So this is a lot of fun to do. And, and it's got the same quarter inch tenon that these other ones do. And I just, you know, when I decided I found something to need, I knew exactly what I, what hole I needed to drill to put that in there. Any questions so far? Let's make some shavings. All right. Indeed. So this is my piece of hard maple. Um, we had some questions a while back about maples, and I've got like four common maples in my area. And I've always sort of wondered what constituted hard maple and soft maple. So I did a little research. And of my four maples, uh, uh, those are silver maple, sugar maple, red maple, and box elder. There's only one of them that classifies as a hard maple, and that's the sugar maple. The others are soft maples. So this is hard maple and probably sugar maple. And uh, I, what I've done is I've got a tenon on the end. I've got my tail stocks up and I've turned it round, okay? So that's where we're picking up in the instructions here, uh, on here. So that's like starting with step, with step number three. I'm gonna begin turning the finial and I'm gonna begin working on this end of it here. And because I've got pressure on here and I've got my, my, uh, my live center in, I want to put the top of my finial further down here. Okay, and the reason why I wanna do that is I don't want any of the, of the bent wood or the holes or stuff I've got from here interfering with the top of my finial. So, and I'm gonna move this camera a little bit, so bear with me here. Okay. Tools I'm gonna to be using tonight. Deep fluted bowl gouge, swept back shoulders. I'm gonna do that for the, for the primary roughing. 
small deep fluted bowl gouge, swept back shoulders. Uh, I will show you how I use this, but I do this for fine detail. Everything is really sharp, by the way. I, I've sharpened everything before doing this. Um, you're going to be working with some small details, and you need you need to make sure your tools are really sharp because a lot of it. I, I really like to get uh, sure cuts with these, so so I don't have to do a lot of sanding on them. And and sharp tools really help. This is a basic skew. It's got a little bit of a rounded edge to it. Um, this is a, a detail gouge. It used to be a spindle gouge. You guys have seen this before. Basically what I did, this is like a half inch spindle gouge. And I just basically steepened the angles and swept the shoulders back a little bit. I made the contour, steepened the angle and swept the shoulders back. What this lets me do is this lets me roll the tool into a groove and do very fine detail with this. And the only other thing I'm gonna be using is this parting tool, okay? Questions on any of this so far? All right, face shield. So the top of my, my, uh, my finial is gonna be about here. And the bottom of my finial is going to be about here. So I want to make a tall cone down to that. Now, while I'm looking at this, that base is a little wide. So I'm going to shorten the base up a little bit and make sure I've got it. Let me see, let me use the skew to do this with. So I'm gonna use the skew and define where the bottom of my base is. Okay. So one of the things that this cone shape does is it forces you into a general overall shape. One of the things that you learn when you're doing, when you're carving wood, is you want some bit of, of the carving, like say you're carving a, a leaves or something, you want one bit of the carving to be on the outside surface of the original vessel. So if somebody looks at it in silhouette, they can see They can still see the original shape and it makes sense as a bowl, even though it's carved. So the same thing is true for these. Is you're getting your general shape outlined. So that, and what that does is it forces you into into making things long and tall, okay? So you don't get the squatty ones like we were talking about earlier. Okay, there's my general shape. And you could do this with a skew too, if you were so inclined. This is going to pop off here in a second. So I want to make, this is the detail gouge. I'm going to make a, a little feature here. This is probably done. All right, hang on. It's not off yet. Okay. I'm gonna make sure I take this bit off at the end. 
because the pressure will will cause the the very thin bits to to bow Am I in the way? I'm hitting my camera. Sorry, guys. Let me shift it over here and do this with it. <laughs> Sorry about that. Any questions so far? Members, this is an inter interactive uh, demonstration. If you do have questions, uh, we like to hear them. It makes it better because if you have that question, somebody else probably does too. I've got a question. At this point, do you have a finial in mind or do you have a plan or, or a favorite design or what? Um, I do. Uh, that finial is basically, uh, I tend to do them. Let me see if I can find what I did with the ones I, I removed here. <laughs> it's basically this, this, this general shape. Okay. It's basically this general shape. Okay. I'm going to put a little feature here, which I kind of sort of been shaping. I'm gonna put a, a sort of a bead here. And then what I like to do is I like to have the transition. I think it looks better to, it looks good to have a transition from this bead. I'm gonna enlarge this, okay? I've got a bead here, all right? And I like having a sort of a, 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 a cone thing here, okay? So the bead is in here, the cone comes in like that. And it, this is all wood, of course. So I like to have that transition into into the thin bit here of the onion like that so that's so that this is my general shape here and and if i can i'm gonna i'm gonna try and scoop this bit out here whoops yeah that didn't work if i can i'm gonna try it and scoop that a bit out a little bit too okay make sense yes okay so i and and the hard maple is really good for, for finials, it, it makes you can you can get some really fine little points on the ends of things. So I like I like doing that a lot using the hard maple for these finials. And not only that, but if you want them black, they dye really well with like the chestnut spirit stain black. So I'm sorry, here it here it is. So so this is this is in general where I'm going with that. Okay. About like that. All right. So here's the little figure, figure on the top. There's a little bead. There's the little cone transition into the thin part, okay? Does that answer the question? Sure does. Yeah, looks great. All right. Thank you. So I'm, gonna, I'm using my, my little detail gouge to shape this bit, and I'm going to put on glasses so I can, so I can see what I'm doing. <laughs> uh, so I, I, can, I can make really fine cuts with this tool. And and get and you can do it with a skew too if you're if you're adept at it. But I can make a really fine cut. Am I, am I in the way? No. Well, we just learned that you're all wearing a shield. Yeah, absolutely, I am. <laughs> Let me uh, zoom in on this. Sorry, I'm trying to zoom in on it here. It's not doing it well. Three, two. I zoomed in the wrong one. Here we go. All right. So I can get a really fine point and scoop it out like that. And then I can, let me turn this up a little bit. And then I can put a little bead in here. You guys see what I'm doing? Yes. Somebody's going to ask you, how, what speed are you spending at right now? Uh, 1950. Thank you, sir. Yep. Is that bead in relation to what the onion is going to be further back? Uh, no, it's in it's in relation to the cone, the 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 larger cone, 
me drop okay. this back a little bit here. No, I, I got you. I understand. So this whole cone is it's just a little bit smaller than the surface of the outside of this cone. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, because I want this, this bit here is probably going to scoop down in here like this and then, and then an onion down about here or maybe further down, maybe here. Um, but I want this to be a little, a little shallower here. Now, one of the things I like to do, and I follow this, a lot of these skill sets here will work uh, with goblets too, especially thin stemmed goblets, is I like doing curved rather than straight stems on goblets and curved rather than straight uh, small bits here on, on, on this part. And the reason why I do that is if, is if something's straight and you make a mistake, even the slightest mistake, is it jumps out at the viewer. But if it's curved, you can get away with slight aberrations and slight mistakes. There are no flat spots in the curve. That's a ba basic design. No flat spots in the curve. Right. If you got the curve right and you don't have a flat spot, you can move the contours of it. You can move the contours of it, whether it, the narrow part is here or here or wherever it is, you can change and move the contours of it and get away with it. Whereas if it's straight, it's got to be straight along the whole, the whole length of it, if you know what I mean. So I'm making, with this tool, I'm cutting, I'm making a very light shearing cut as I roll it into the, into the thin bits. Now's the time to sand this, okay? So, and I'm also, with, with this tool, I'm also cutting on the side of the flute. So I'm, I'm rolling the tool in and I'm getting a cut along the side of the flute, which gives me a shearing cut. Is that clear to people or would anybody like an explanation further of that? Well, look at the shavings he's generating, members. Look at, the, look, there's no chips down there. There are shavings. So I'm, I'm getting here until I cut and then I'm getting streamers. Can't really see them, but they're really little streamers. <laughs> Okay, let's do a little more talk talk here um, about, about the, the onion. So the onion, this bit here, right? Mm -hmm. So what it is, is it's two, it's basically an OG, okay? You've got one set of, you've got one set of contours that starts off like this and it curves the same way. And then as you start to get in here, it transitions and goes around here. So you've got, you know, you're cutting this way and then you're cutting this way, all right? So it's, it's a basic OG. Matt? Yes. We're not, we're not seeing what you're drawing. Oh, I'm sorry. My bad. There you go. <laughs> Thank you, Brenda. Because <laughs> I go. zoomed in. Let me, uh, let me do this. Dang it. <laughs> I'll have to do it all over again. All right. Sorry, guys. <laughs> so your OG, it starts off one set of curves and it's curving like this, okay? So like that. And then about here, about here, you transition into this bit and the curve the other way down into the base of it, okay? So that's your OG that you're doing. And, and what, it, if you make this bit too fat, okay, then it doesn't look right. So what you want to do with these onions is you want to start that transition. You want to elongate your onion a little bit, okay? And don't make it, you know, look like a Hershey's kiss or whatever, okay? So that's what I've done or what I've tried to do with this one here, okay? And I don't know if you can really see that very well. How about the back? There we go. That's better. Um, 
So I start my transition here and it's a very gentle curve down into here. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, good. So I've elongated that onion to, to keep it from turning into a Hershey's kiss. So I'm gonna do the same thing here and Now I want to make this bit here thinner, okay? Let me zoom in a little more here. So I want to make this part here thinner because I want to make this part here thinner, okay? So that's what I'm going to do here. And I'm going to start my, cur my curve down into my base there. So now I'm going to cut downhill and make this bit thinner. All right, so let's get the. If I can't get my base better defined, this is a skew and I'm using the tip. Like I say, you can you can do this onion with the skew like I'm doing here. You can do it with the detail gouge. You can do it with the bowl gouge. I can come back and hit this with the skew this way. Now you're taking, I'm taking very light cuts here because again, this is, this is a, this is, this is going to get thin here in a hurry. So that's probably, well, maybe a little thinner. And I want this to be thinner. So what I've got, I've got the, the tool, the, this deep fluted bowl gouge, small deep fluted bowl gouge is laying on top of the, of the finial. And I am cutting with the bottom flute and I'm getting a shear cut when I do that. Really? Really? I'm, oh gosh, sorry. <laughs> Now I could do that with the tip. Now I can get really thin doing this because the pressure is not that way, it's that way. Okay, make sense? Yeah, very much. I know, yeah, excitement is permitted. If you see something that excites you. Go ahead. So that's still a little thick for my taste. Yeah, let's make it a little smaller. All right, and now let's round this out here. That's probably as thin as I dare go with that. And let me dig through here and find a little bit of sandpaper here. Okay, so I'm gonna use my finger, I'm gonna sand one direction and use my finger to equalize that pressure. Actually, let me start a little thicker. So, and the reason why I'm doing that is so I don't snap this thing off.
Okay, questions so far? I like the shape of the onion. I got to learn. Thank you. That. Okay, just to make sure I understand what you said, when you're cutting this length, coming back to the onion, your tool is on top of the wood. You're cutting with the bottom wing. I'm cutting with this bottom flute in the middle of it. Yeah. I'm cutting here and yeah. it's on top. So I'm coming and I'm getting a very sharp angle with that bottom flute. Okay. Okay. And the pressure is that direction into the headstock. It's yeah. not that way because I don't want to pop it out any pressure. And it's not much pressure of any kind. I'm letting the tool edge do the, do the cutting. Okay, okay, so I don't know if you guys can see how steep that angle is of that tool, but I'm cutting on, the, you know, up here. This is where I'm cutting in the middle of this flute and coming this way. Okay. Uh -huh. And if you're doing that with a skew, it's the same. It's the same thing. You've got to get a steep angle. So you get your, your slicing cut, your, your shearing cut. And ideally, you want to go downhill. Okay. So, you know, coming uphill is not, you're going you're gonna to introduce some, some, uh, some tear out if you come uphill. So you want to go downhill. You know, I, I, I did a little bit of the coming uphill, but I came back and, 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 and mm -hmm. cleaned it up a little bit. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Does that answer the question? Yes, it did. Yes, it did. Okay. Does that answer the question? Yeah. All right. Good. Anything else? I'm going to have a weird question at the end, but okay, but it, it wouldn't be appropriate right now. Okay, <laughs> it, it has to do with sharpening the the uh, the uh, detail gouge. I keep screwing up the sharpening of my detail gouge. Okay, we'll cover that at the end. Yeah. All right. Let me let me let me quickly go back to my uh, to my document here and see where we are. Oh. Um, all right, number, uh, point number five, any pressure applied by tools or sanding must be matched by equal pressure to minimize bowing and or chattering. If necessary, bring in a steady rest or similar device to reduce vibration on the free end. Okay, now number seven here has applied throughout this, this, uh, this demonstration is take very thin cuts with very sharp tools especially if the stem is getting very thin. Now we're out of danger here. Um, and I can finish this off uh, without, without using the, uh, without, without using the, the, little, uh, the little helper here. But this is how that works. There's a bearing in this end, in the top end here. And you basically just move it up so it's, it's just touching. And what that does is it keeps this from vibrating. Okay, so this is just to keep it from, from breaking off, okay? And you don't have to use it. I could probably finish. All right, tell me this, guys. Would you rather see me finish it using this or not using it? I'll use it. Yeah, okay. use it, please. All right. <laughs> ah, you, guys. you say okay. you got that from Ducky? Yeah, this is this is rubber Chucky, uh, Don yeah, Doyle at rubber Chucky, and uh, I don't, he calls it a finial Chucky or something like that. A finial okay. Chucky, okay. Yep. Okay. Now this this line here is my base. This is going to be the bottom. Okay. So the little let me get my little example bit here. So this little that's this bit here that this base here. Okay. So whatever I'm doing now. Is, is, is this bit here is in this space, okay? So we're going to, I'm gonna get my deep fluted, my big one out. And get a little closer to where, there's the top of, of my base. So I'm going to get this fairly close to keep that, that overall shape in place. 
so that you know it, it, there's a continuation in in out in in the outside contours like that that makes sense so that's probably good there Do you ever get the box out and like hold it up next to there to see if it's in proportion to what you're making it for? Um, no, usually what I do is, is I make a bunch of these in different oh. shapes and sizes and all with a quarter inch tenon. And then when I've got something that I want to put a tenon on, I've got, you know, five, six, eight of them that I can say, oh, that one's the right size. But if all I've right. got to make one for it, I, I have a when I start off, I've got a really good idea about how I want that, you know, how big I want that to be. So if I'm making one specifically for something, then I have a general idea, you know, whether it's three inches or six inches or, or what. And even if you're just making a little knob to go on the top of a box, then you know, you know, you know how big that is. And if I've made one. I mean, I, when I first started making boxes, I, I, I had difficulty getting that right. Yeah. So, I mean, I made a box with a knob on the top of it that was really kind of obscenely too big, you know, and you're like, you know, somebody bought it and I'm grateful for that person, but it's like, you look at it and you say, you know, that really doesn't work very well. I could do better than that. <laughs> <laughs> I knew woodworkers that made, made dresser drawer knobs and they would make eight of eight of many different sizes and then pick the one that worked yeah yeah and that's that's kind of what i do with the finials i mean you saw the batch i have here yeah yeah good idea <clears throat> so and i like to undercut these And, you know, again, you could you could do this with a skew. I'm using the detail gouge to do it because it works and I can curve it easily. But I could easily do that with a skew. And I'm making a slicing cut into the bottom here. Okay, so I'm happy with that transition. I like this. Well, let's get cleaned up a little. But I like the sizes. I like the proportions of things. I love the proportions. So, and I would come back with, you know, with some sandpaper and clean this up and So now I've got to make my, my little tenon here. So this stuff becomes and I'm going to switch to parting tool. Now the, the, the bit on the end, the rubber chucky, finial chucky that's ho holding this is not exerting any pressure. It's just keeping it in place. So I don't have that problem of, of, of having, you know, the little tenon tear out. Now, one of the things to do is you never know if your box top or, or your vase top is gonna be curved. So it's usually a good idea to undercut the, the base of the finial. So I'm doing that right now. I, I, one of the things I like about the way I've ground this tool is it lets me undercut things easy. And the reason why it undercuts things easily is it's not quite straight. It's a little slanted. Mm -hmm. Okay. And this was an experiment because I saw somebody else did it. And I said, you know, that looks interesting. 
So I bought a cheap tool. I think the tool cost me 15 bucks. Benjamin Best, you gotta love it. And ground it the way I, I wanted to. And, and I, I screwed it up the first time I ground it because it was too steep. But I'm really happy with this and it's one of my favorite tools and I use it a lot. Uh, one of the things I can do with this, if I'm going straight in parting, it goes in really easily. But I can also turn it a little bit and sort of get a, a slicing scrape and get a really smooth cut with it just by turning it a little bit. So it's, and it's just a basic parting tool. Interesting. All right. So I'll get out my handy dandy gauge here. Got a ways to go yet. Let's check it. I'm nearly there. Just a smidge left. Any questions about any of this that I'm doing right now? Do you use the same tools if you were turning it out of uh, like ebony or blackwood? Yes. I use, I use pretty much these same tools for just about everything. I'm putting pressure on this now. <laughs> so I'm a quarter inch all the way down here. So now because I'm a wimp and this is a demo, I'm going to saw it. Let's go find it under the lathe here. <laughs> okay, so here's my here's the finial that I've just turned. Beautiful. Very okay. Good. Thank you. And I've got to you know clean this up so it'll fit in a quarter inch hole, but that is a quarter inch. So and this is I like the way this looks. That could be a little tighter. But in, you know, and there's a little bit of a flat spot in there, but by and large, I'm pretty happy with that. Great job, man. So thank you. Um, absolutely. Thank you. I I'm sorry. What was the question that came in earlier? So I, I about the wood. About the gouge. Are you referring to that? Yeah, the spindle the, gouge. The, yeah, for the detail gouge, for some reason, every time I try to create a detail gouge, I end up with something that looks more like a harpoon. I know you know what I mean. You've got a nice curve on the end of it. Why do I well, keep ending up with something that looks like a the, needle the, at the end? The key to reshaping these tools, this started off as a spindle gouge, okay? So, so the, you know, the grind on it was here. Uh -huh. And it was 75 degrees or whatever that is, okay? So I have the true grind sharpening system. Uh -huh. And... If you look that up on YouTube, it came with a DVD and they put their, that video up on YouTube. And it's a great video because the, the, like the second half of it is how to sharpen all your tools with really good pictures, really good views. And it, it'll work for the Wolverine. It'll work on a platform because if you watch how, you know, how they're getting the angles right and so on, and, and they show you how to do, how to make a deep fluted bowl gouge. Okay. Okay. Uh, how to make an Irish grind out of a deep fluted bowl gouge. And I use that information. And the first thing they talk you, they tell you to do is when you're making an, an Irish grind is you, the first thing you do is you shape this contour. Okay. So let me get that in profile. This is a curved contour. So the first thing you do is you shape this contour. Okay. okay? And then you make the bevel and then you, you, you grind the sides to match. Okay. So taking that information, the way I did it, is I, I put this on the grinder and I shaped this contour how I liked it. Okay? okay. So I got this round first. Okay. Right. Then 
I, I, I set the bevel angle I wanted. And then I spent most of the time getting the sides the way I wanted. And then the last thing you do is you just take it, you know, you've got your angle on your, on your grinder, and then you just, you just take it all the way around the grinder one time, one pass when it's all close, you know, taking, just evening things up. Okay. Uh, that explains what I've been doing wrong. Okay. I, I appreciate that. It, yeah. I and I really hold this silly up. about it. That's okay. We all have, you know, things that get in our way. So no problem. So, and then I hone this a lot and it's just, you set it on the bevel and then you hone it. Beautiful. So, I mean, you can see I hone this. Okay. I'm sorry. Other questions. I want everybody to jump in there. No questions. Thank you. Very great. Yep, you did a great job. It's hard to have questions when you do such a thorough job of explaining. <laughs> Thank right. you. You're very excellent. kind. <laughs> that was an excellent demo. Thank you, Matt. You're welcome. I hope I hope that I've answered a lot of the questions. Um, you guys understand how the onion works. Uh, I've gone over the uh, the basics of how uh, of how to do thin turning because thin that thin stuff it's the same same techniques that works on thin stemmed goblets. You know you, you know you just you need to you can't put pressure on the thin pieces of wood that you're turning, or if you're turning a trembler or whatever they call those long, thin things that are six foot long and inch, you know, fractions of an inch thick. Do you ever finish it on the? Um, I don't. Usually, a lot of times, I'll end up uh, uh, dyeing them black. So uh, I will get them sanded, and then I'll and then I'll. Uh, then I'll, you know, dip them in, in, in the chestnut spirit stain to make them black. Cause that's usually what color they end up being. So, uh, and then, then I'm usually spraying lacquer or spar urethane or poly or something like that. On, uh, when I go and make finials, uh, cutting up towards my onion, I will get, um, uh, hard spots. I don't know the right term. Uh, I've tried putting a relief bevel on my tool, and that helps some, but not a whole heck of a lot. But I was. When you say hard spot. When yeah. you say hard hard spot, is that where you're burnishing the wood because you're yeah, writing the yeah, bevel? Yeah, 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 yeah. Cutting? Okay. Well, the game the game that I play with that is is I am again getting a sure cut with the edge of the tool. I'm writing the bevel a little bit. Okay. Mm -hmm. But I'm getting a sure cut with the edge, with the flute of the tool. Okay. So I ride that in like that. I'm riding the bevel, but lightly. I'm letting the tool edge do the cutting, but I'm making sure that it's the tool edge in a shearing angle to, that does the cutting, whether yeah. it's, it's this tool or, or this tool. It's the same thing. You got to make sure you got that shearing edge and you're letting the edge do the cutting. Uh, yeah, that, I have that, made these with just a skew because somebody said, show me how you do that with just a skew. So uh, I'm not as good with the skew as, as, as I am with some of the other tools, like I, I think the deep fluted bull gouge, but it's the same technique is you want, you want to get that edge shearing and, and you want to do all your cutting with that, that edge, that tool edge, while you're riding, gently riding the bevel down into the cut. Make sense? Yeah. That, that's why I was so surprised when you were talking about riding on top of your uh, finial uh, and cutting with the bottom edge flute. I, I don't think I've ever done that. So, well, you know, get, get a piece of wood, make it round and make shavings and practice that cut because yeah. it'll yeah. serve you really, really well. Yeah. I, mean, I do it. I do it a lot. I mean, you saw me doing it with this tool. So with the big mm -hmm. deep fluted bull gouge. So I do the same thing especially when I'm turning a goblet, I will, I will sit down here. I'll start off, see if it, I'll start off with the tool tip going right into the wood, getting a sure cut. But then I will, as I get to the point where I'm going down the stem, I will begin, I will, the tool, I will roll the tool up through that curve so that by the time I get to the point where I'm doing the stem, I'm in that same position. I'm right. I'm, I'm sitting on top of the piece okay. and I'm riding, but I'm cutting the edge with the tool edge in the shear. Okay. So you're only right. You're not putting pressure on it with the bevel. You're just sort of letting it ride. Now, if you get softer wood, if you're doing it with pine, then you, you stand a, a better chance of getting those hard spots of burnishing the wood with the bevel. 
So you've got to be, you know, it's just a guide. You, it can't be pushing it into the, into the wood, if you will, if that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Anything Matt, else? Matt, I think, I think one of the other things that you, you kind of hit on, but kind of glanced over it going downhill. If you're taking that gouge or any other tool and you're trying to come uphill, you're going to press that bevel into the wood behind it. And uh, that's, Again, that's another issue. That's, that's uh, with, with yeah, yeah, and, and, and and right. I mean, and the temptation is to 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 ride. Oops, let me switch back to this. The temptation is to ride to ride that tool the whole length of the cut. Well, you can't really do that because when you're riding down this way, when you start to come back up, now you're cutting unsupported wood, and you're going to raise the wood. You're going to get tear out. So when you start coming back uphill, right? This is downhill into the cut, and this is uphill if you're coming this way. So that's why you cut to the middle and cut to the middle. Now I can get away with a certain amount of going this way if I'm taking really light shearing cuts and the pressure is into the tailstock rather than coming out, if you know what I mean, or going in. But as soon as I start, if, the, if it's just the tool edge cutting, as soon as I start to get steeper here, I'm gonna start raising the grain, just like you said, that's an excellent point. Okay, I give it a shot, thank you. Yep. Anybody else? Jump right in. I think I, did I have another now, page here? Yes, I did. I did. I've got another page here where I've got links and resources. Uh, so this, these are these are YouTube links, and the string steady rest. If you want to use it, there's two different versions here, and link to Cindy Drozda's stuff on her page. Okay. And all of this will be on our website. Dave says tomorrow. They will get this up tomorrow. Absolutely. Yep. And um, boy, that's Matt. This has been great. You covered it from what they say, soup to nuts. You showed us the technique of design, the cutting, um, even tools that you've modified to get it to work better. And you've eliminated some mysteries about um, what we can do with. Whoa, what is that? What are you doing? This is a spare blank. Billy asked in Bill asked in, in the in the in chat if I had a spare blank. And I, yes, I did. <laughs> in case I broke it. <laughs> we work through that. We do we really do. We've had that happen to some of the best turners we've ever had. All it does is show me that you're human, just like me. And yep. those things happen. But tonight absolutely. it didn't happen. You did absolute wonderful, sir. Wonderful. Well, and, and that's, you know, getting those cuts, and I can't emphasize that enough, is, is sharp tools, light cuts, going downhill. That's the real key to getting this done. And, and make sure that you don't push it so you break it. So any pressure, lateral pressure that's not into the headstock is good, you know, could easily break it. So just be careful with that. And let the tool edge do the work. Yep. And I just, I think you gave somebody advice a few moments ago is chuck up a piece of wood and go practice your cuts. Yep. Just, just practice your cuts. And if you think, well, what that good, what good is that going to do? Well, next time you crank up the lathe, that's going to do wonders for you. So thank you, Matt. Any other questions for Matt tonight? Thank you very wow. much, Matt. Truly. Thank you. It's my pleasure, everyone. I'm, I'm happy to, to show the, sure. these things sure. that I know, and I look forward to what we, everybody does with it. We enjoyed it too, Matt. Believe me, it's something. All right, there you have it, folks. Another week with another great demonstration.